Hey guys, welcome to part two of this series of a day in the life of a bar consultant and developer. I thought this would be a great idea to film this on a walk. It's quite windy, so I'm probably going to look somewhere where I can actually see something. Hmm. Okay, this is much better. Not the best, but much better. Look, we've got this lovely comrade or comrade behind us. can't remember what it's called. That used to be in Manchester City Centre. And like 1800s, they moved it here for some reason. I don't know, but pretty cool. Bit of architecture. I feel like a tour guide now. I'm in my local park, there is people around. I'm just speaking into this microphone about the the comrade. Um, but that's not the point of today. The point of today is it's a day in the life. I thought I'd explain a little bit about behind the scenes of what went on yesterday, because it is now the day after. So if you've not seen the last video, let me explain what I'm trying to do. Is I work freelance as a bar consultant and developer, and I want to show the behind the scenes for a few good reasons. Now this was all meant to be one video, but I've split it up because so much stuff happened yesterday that it's unjust worthy to put it in one video. It's gonna be like 30 minutes long, so I'm gonna split it into the two, which is what you're getting now, part two. So check out yesterday's, that was a bit different. Um, like I said, I'm currently in the currently in a park doing this. Got thought better scenery, going a little bit of a walk. So if I get attacked, you're my witness. Okay? I've gone off trail. Beautiful day for it. Why not? Point being, why am I vlogging? Why am I vlogging this? And what went on? Because like I said, a lot of issues went on yesterday. And if you're wondering why I'm off track. I'm trying to get to a lake, but the lake's always full of people. But I've got like a little sneaky suspicion, call it locals' intuition, that this take me to a little private bit, my own little private bit of the lake. So we shall see about that. Nope, not private at all. There's people there, so I'm going back on the trail, I guess. All right, that's ruined my idea. I thought that'd be a nice, lovely backdrop, but guess not. All right, so I'm back on the path, I guess. I'll try and find another sneaky way to the lake, but for now, let me explain why I'm doing this vlog. All right, the bar I'm working for currently is quite the high-end bar, you know? It's, it's very classy, it's very put together, full of glitz and glam. You go up there, everything's polished to a high degree. All the best kind of cutlery, the best chefs, the best bartenders. It's just dripping with Armani and Chanel and even all the people that work there are all suited up. So it's easy to imagine that when it comes to something like cocktail development and when they change their menu, how they get those drinks on, it's very easy to put it in your head that the whole process is just as luxurious as the bar, you know? Such as, you, you kind of think of it like chef's table, right? They go in, beautiful scenery, they've got all the best produce in town, all the best ingredients, but that's not always true. You see, a big part of putting the cocktails together is the creative side, it's a creative outlook. It's not just like food, which is mainly on focus, which is mainly focused on um, the flavour, but the drinks obviously have to be a good flavour, but it's more the creative side. So for that, sometimes you've got to hire out people like me. Um, I'm at the lake now, by the way, I found a little sneaky path. Look at this, there we go, there's the lake. Let me get a closer look at this so I can really show you. Ooh. Hey. So this place is full, they'll normally have boats out and over there, if you go all around the lake, there's loads of people like sitting down and chilling, especially on a nice day like today, but this bit is completely private. So undiscovered territory, hey, pretty good. Anyway, as I was saying, it's not always luxurious. So I wanted to show you that, the unluxurious sides of it, the creative mess. Because the fact is, the truth of the matter is, when you go into a place like this and you're buying like a £15 cocktail, a lot of that is the experience and the luxury that comes with it. You're surrounded by everything that's kind of high class, expensive. You feel expensive when you buy one of these cocktails. If you knew that kind of behind the scenes, behind the smoke screen of it all, it was just some guy from Manchester throwing them together at home, 
and then ticking them off saying, yeah, that'll do, might ruin it a bit for you. But I know there's a lot of people out there, especially people that work in the industry, that might want to feel like they're not up for that challenge, they can't work in those kind of bars, they're not fit for those environments just because they don't wear suits every day, they don't bartend in tight jeans or, or tight pants, should I say. They don't fit the mould, right? But that is not true, because that is exactly what I'm doing. So I thought it would be very interesting to show you that, that side of it, right? The behind the scenes in that way. The truth of the matter is that, you know, it's different in every bar. But in this one in particular that I'm working in, because it's a long way, because it's in London, and it's a global company, the head offs, the people who can really make the changes on the menus, they all live in America. So it's not like I'm going to travel to America to get something ticked off. Yeah, I could go to the bar and get it done with the management there, but, you know, trip from Manchester to London is quite expensive. I can't do that every day. So what I've done in this new virtual world is I kind of create the cocktails at home and then I'm going to go down with the tasting. So throughout it, I'm talking to them about kind of my inspiration, the flavours. I share a few photos of what the development's looking like, but they're not actually tasting it until the day of the tasting. So that's the big thing, that's when it comes together, right? It's all one thing putting together all these ideas and creating these cocktails, but it's another thing to actually go down and present them and have them sign off and say, yeah, actually that tastes nice, or that looks good, that fits the brand, that's going to be logistical, a logistical fit, let's do it. So that is what this vlog's about. Yesterday was the day before, that's the day where I'm getting everything ready, I'm packing the bags, I'm tasting all the, I'm prepping all the ingredients, because a lot of the ingredients you've got to do the day before. Right, syrups and things like that. You don't want to, you know, you don't want to serve like a two-week-old syrup to someone. So all the ingredients, a lot of them have to be prepped the day before. A lot of them take a long time to prep, and then things like garnishes. So I've got to put them all together the day before, pack them up, then go down do the tasting. Thought it'd be interesting. Yesterday was the day before, so that was me putting everything together for the tasting. Show you the hectic mess, the fact that behind this smoke screen of luxury and you know, 15 pound cocktails and that, this high-end environment. How to get those drinks on the menu, these high-class menus, these, these luxury drinks that you're sipping on, is actually done in a Manchester home by me, in my pyjamas, just like listening to this, chilling out, listening to a bit of Elvis, listening to a little bit of Ariana Grande, just, you know, minding my own business. I'm pyjama in it. I don't even have shoes on half the time, I'm wearing slippers, and that's what's contributing to luxury. You see, to get to luxury, it's not about the journey, it's about the end product. You can throw a luxury thing. I was once in a, like a beluga competition. We, it was about, all about luxury. So we had, a, we had a speech from someone, I think it was Philip Duff, you know, bartending legend, industry legend. He was talking about luxury, I saying that it's not just about the glitz and glam, but it is about exclusivity, having something that someone else can't get. You can, you know, I could have a restaurant right in this forest with some fold-out chairs, but if I make it super exclusive, only two seats available, food that you're not going to get anywhere else, that no one else is going to cook, then suddenly it becomes luxury, okay? Even if I'm here in my pyjamas, even if I'm here in my dirty hooder, it doesn't matter. It's about the journey. If you watched yesterday, you saw my kitchen by the end of it. There was shit all over, ingredients all over, bags all over. It doesn't matter. It matters about what it looks like at the end when it is served by someone in a suit, when it's in a clean, polished glass with a spectacular garnish and it's put in front of them. Then the ingredients really shine, then it all comes together on what luxury is. Yesterday, as I say, so I had the day before and then Technically, what I'm counting as today, but was yesterday, was the tasting day. So I did a few things from the morning, and here's what that went like. Good morning. Then after that, I got caught up, and I couldn't do any filming, I'm afraid. And let me explain all the issues that unfolded for that day. So I wake up, my train is at quarter past 11. I get up at 9, that's all right, because I need to get a 15-minute tram to the train station, so it's not too bad, right? I don't have to set off until, like, half 10. It's all right. That gives me plenty of time to get some breakfast. I wake up, I put some sheets together. When I do a tasting like this and it's got more than one person and people are coming a long way for it, I like to give them the benefit, especially when it's a lot of cocktails. 
so they can write notes and they can really be clear on what their feedback is. It helps them decide what they like and it also helps me refine them after the feedback. So I just write down all the cocktails, the ingredients, what's in it in case they forget anything that I say. And then I'll do like a little one out of 10. How does it taste? How does it look? How does it fit the brand? And then a little note section. So once they fill that up, they can just buy the 20th cocktail. You forgot what cocktail two was. You can go back and then, oh yeah, I like that one. Oh, actually I didn't like that one. So I did that in the morning, sent those over to the bar to get printed as well as the specs, packed up the bag, set off, perfect timing, get the tram. Oh, there's a bee. Ooh. Nature, nature's crazy around here. Yeah. Um, oh, some people are getting some of the boats now. You can't see, you can't see, but people on the boats. There's ducks, can you see them? You can't see. Point being, so I get on the tram, nothing can ruin this day, it's planned to a T. I've got my nice jeans on, I've got my nice black shirt on, I've got my suitcase, I'm on my way. 15 minutes in between, easy. I'm going to get myself some breakfast, I'm going to, you know, get ready for the train, get there nice and early. It's what it is. Then suddenly the tram is delayed. The only thing that can stop this perfect plan, a tram delay. The tram that's meant to take 18 minutes has now taken 40 minutes because of the delay. Like I said, my train is at quarter past 11. The tram gets to my stop at 12 minutes past 11. The longest delay on a tram ever, I've worked it out, is 106% increase on time. So that's really annoying. So I'm about 10 minutes from the train station, but I think I can make it in three minutes. So I run with my case, heavy case, full of glassware. I'm thinking to myself, probably all smashed up to pieces now, but it's what it is. I'm gonna make this train run there. Don't make the train, obviously miss it. Try to speak to the people at the gate and say, look, I've just missed it because of the tram. Anyway, I can like get another one. No, you gotta, you gotta buy a ticket. Um, so I say, oh, but I bought a ticket. You know, don't look busy the next train. Can I just jump on? No. Is there any way I can redeem my ticket? To get like, so I don't have to pay the full price of the other one because I missed it? No. Go to the ticket office, try and speak to them about it. So they're the same, just as stubborn. It's not going to happen. So I have to buy a new ticket. You know how much it costs to get to Manchester to London on the day? £68.60. We'll get to London anyway, and then I've got to navigate the underground. And it's at this point that I realise that in the rush or something on the kind of baggage section, the rack on the train, my suitcase is broke, the wheels broke. So now I've got to drag it and it's a really heavy suitcase. It's just, you saw it yesterday, it's just full of bottles of liquid and glasses. Super heavy and I've got to drag that around London. I'm wearing this massive coat. It's about 20 degrees or something. It's, it's well warm. I'm dragging it around. I, I can't do the underground anyway. I can't navigate that for to save my life. So I'm trying to navigate throughout London. Finally get to the bit where I'm supposed to get to. Realise it's a 10 minute walk or a 10 minute drag of the suitcase. So there are the issues in the morning, but finally get there. Get there, get into the place, spectacular. Overwhelmingly nice, really high up. It's got this, both bars are on top of each other so you can get to them both dead easy. I get the tour, you know, I meet the head of the bars there. Real nice guy, just got on with him instantly. He gives me the tour around, you know, they've got like four terraces fire pits, massive tree bars, got about five different bars within the two bars. Crazy. Everyone else comes, I kind of set up at this event bar. So there's no one there, so I don't have to worry about customers getting in the way or bartenders around there. It's just us and the guys who are going to be in the tasting. So I introduce myself to them. Um, two of them, one already lives in London, two have came from America. So really high up, really nerve wracking. I give them a, a shaky, sweaty shake of the old, of the old hand. Um, then we start the tasting. Luckily, I got a bartender with me, so the way it works is I'm going to read off the specs and what's meant to be in the cocktails. He's going to make the cocktails for me, and I'm going to do those finishing touches, the garnishing. And then the guy who would have spoke about, the really nice guy, the head of bars, he's going to take it from the bar to where they're set, which is about two meters in front of me, where they can taste it. That way, we've got a system where it's 20 cocktails, you only have to spend like five minutes on each. You're not sitting there for too long, getting absolutely wrecked. You know, you've got a nice system of cocktails coming out. As, as you're finishing one, another one's coming. So you can taste them all, give you feedback, do what you got to do. So we wrapped up that pretty quickly. That was real nice. 
Um, had a great time doing it. Like I said, a lovely bar, lovely to be there. And then we sit down with them. Normally you expect a lot of feedback, especially when they've not been involved in the development stage. It means that once we're there, and I keep saying we, but it's just me. That's another thing you expect when there is a new menu. It's like a team of people putting it together. But in reality, it's just me. When I say we, I mean me and my multiple personalities. So me and said personalities, we sit down and we have a little bit of meeting about the feedback. It goes really smooth. Like I said, when they're not involved in the development, or what I was trying to say, is they're always going to be nitpicker. Especially when you've got like four head-offs, they control the brand and you're asking them to, this is something that works, your current menu, but well, let's change it. They're always going to be a bit iffy with it, so you can expect a lot of feedback, but there weren't actually that much. In fact, most of the feedback was on the presentation. And this haven't really been focused on the drinks, but I will explain a few from yesterday. I had that clarified raspberry one, which I said confidently would be the one. That's going to work. It didn't. It wasn't the favourite, actually. It tore the crowd. Some of them liked it, some of them didn't really like it. So that was a shocker. The one that was actually the favourite is one that I didn't even show yesterday. Because I thought, no chance of this one. It's a bit basic. There's nothing going on with it. And it's like a matcha green tea with grapefruit, lemon, gin, and what else did I put in there? Light G. So it's like this kind of tropical flavour, a bit bitter, a bit botanical, a bit sweet, a bit sour, good balance. Um, that's the one that was actually the favourite. Everyone loved it. They could have put that on the menu tomorrow. That, it could be on the menu right now is how much they love that one. It's like they love the flavour, they love the look, they love the taste, they want to change a the thing. They just absolutely love that one, which is crazy because I thought that would just be the, you know, that's a side cocktail that I just kind of put in as a filler. Um, what else? The shiitake one, I spoke about the mushroom when I said I like the flavour. I'm not sure on the garnish. Said I might change the garnish. Did I change it? No, I didn't. What did they say? Not so sure about the garnish, so should have stuck with my gut there and um well I did stick my gut, should have not stuck with my gut and should have changed it. Um some of the others, you know. It was oh I didn't even tell you about my other issue. So I had this jelly, it was like a mimosa prosecco jelly. And I also had these like little pineapple garnishes with coconut on them. To save space, I put them in the same Tupperware box. And during the running around, they must have smashed together, so both garnishes was ruined. So there was two cocktails that went out completely ungarnished, so you couldn't even see what they were. <laughs> then the goji, remember I stayed up all night prepping that goji berry syrup and thought I was on to something new? I was on something spectacular? What I didn't count for is when I use goji berry liqueur, it's a lot lighter. And the end cocktail is kind of like a orangey, reddish, pinkish hue to it. it looks really, really lovely. But because what I did was make this syrup out of pure acai, it was a lot darker. So when I made the cocktail, I looked at it and I said, well, well the colour's not really the same. And it tasted delicious, but it doesn't matter how much it tastes, when the cocktail itself looks like muddy water, you don't want to drink it. Uh, no matter how much, it was a beautiful tasting cocktail, but that was the one with the pineapple garnish. So when it's got no garnish, it just comes in like a glass, completely unsophisticated, and looks like muddy water. No one's going to want that. That's half the battle. You know, coming up with these cocktails, the flavour is really the first go-to, which you can kind of learn. You learn the science of flavour, and you kind of get a feeling on what goes nice together. And not just that, but what sounds like it'll be nice, you know. Pineapple and coconut taste really good. Uh, but none of this tastes good, sounds like it tastes good. So that's easier. The next thing is always about the logistics, how you're going to do it. Are you going to do pineapple juice or pineapple liqueur? Are you going to macerate the pineapple within, you know, rum for two weeks and then add coconut to that, dry coconut, make a kind of dry pineapple coconut spirit? Who knows? You know, then it's about the presentation. How's it going to look? Are you just going to put some coconut on top, a little line of desiccated coconut? Are you going to rim the glass? Are you going to use pineapple leaf? Or are you going to do something a bit crazy, a bit out there, and make like pineapple jelly? You know, that has the biggest impact of all, is the press, the presentation and the logistics of how you get. The flavours is easy. The creative part of it, anyone can do the flavours. The part where they hire out people, the part why you get paid more for kind of being the person that creates them, the developer. The part of the developer is the logistics and the presentation, which is funny I say that because at the end of the presentation, like I said, they gave the feedback. They all pretty much liked all the cocktail. The only issue was presentation and logistics. So I big myself up there and 
that's exactly what they would change, but who knows? So that was the day. Finished off, felt good. I had about three hours to wait for my train. So they were so nice, they were so friendly. What they did was they put me in one of the restaurants and said, eat what you want, drink what you want. We've had a good day. And I thought that was really nice of them. Like I said, it's a really expensive restaurant. Loads of people waiting to get in. And they just put me at like the best seat in the house, a table for four people and it's just me there. And then put this tab on, I had like 20 pound smoked salmon, like an 18 pound lobster roll. I had like two cocktails, like I said, they're about 15 pound each. So that's just feeling like an absolute boss. Like I said, surrounded by the customers that are in like Armani suits and women head to toe, Louis Vuitton, Chanel. And there's me in my nice jeans, to be fair, they are quite nice jeans and a shirt which is a pretty sweaty shirt at this point. Just sitting down, feeling like a boss, getting all my food and drinks for free, getting waited on, like the best service in the place. I felt like an absolute boss. I sat there and I felt, you know, you've made it now. You've worked a lot of dive bars. You've worked a lot of bad bar jobs. To try and make it, to get someone to respect your creativity. The whole aim is to get someone to want to work with you to this degree, to someone to say, you know what? You've got a creative streak. We want you to develop a menu for us without us putting our fingers in it too much and kind of nitpicking. And I feel like I've made it now because throughout all those dive bars, I'm now sat in one of the best restaurants in London, the highest restaurant in London, being served some of the best food from some of the best chefs and having some amazing cocktails, feeling like an absolute boss. And that's it. I get home. And I was going to do all this at home, but you know, you can imagine after my stress of the day, I just wasn't feeling it. Next steps, what happens after this? Well, what happens after this now is we figure out logistics, it's kind of four more, three more, three, ooh, another bee, damn it. You know, bees everywhere here. Next steps, take their feedback and refine the drinks. Look at the presentation, the garnishing, really refine those specs, how those drinks are going to be made. Refinement. After that, it's logistics. Where are we gonna get the ingredients from? How are they gonna prep all these ingredients and the garnishes to make sure that they don't run out of anything? You don't wanna to get to the point where it's a really good selling cocktail, but oh, this ingredient takes too long to prep or has a short shelf life. So we really need to look closely at the shelf life of the prepped ingredients, how difficult they are to make and how we're gonna go about making them at a large scale. There's lots of people coming in and out of this bar You've got to imagine that even if it's not a good seller, we've got to sell quite a lot of any given drink. So you've got to get the logistics right and the costing. Because you don't want, even though they cost like £15, you don't want the cocktail itself to cost £16 and you're losing money per drink. So we've got to get the GP right at about 70%. So we work out all the logistics, we refine them a little bit, then it's training day, I'll go back to London and I'll have a training day with all the bartenders. That should be fun because now I'm comfortable. I've been there before, I'm comfortable. And training bartenders is a breeze because all they want to do is drink. And when you're training someone on a cocktail, you kind of have to drink it to know what's going on. So that's going to be a breeze. And then after that, it's launch day. So that comes with nerves. Why people don't like the cocktails. People are always, especially regulars, are always going to be impartial to change. Not going to, not going to want any change, I mean. They're, they're going to be a bit iffy with it. Well, that's it from me today. And I guess I'll catch you on another vlog. Peace out.